Good morning, everyone. So um, welcome to day five. We're going to talk about an application of, of topological field theory to a mathematical question, which is computing Hurwitz numbers. Um, before that, I'd just like to say thanks. Thanks to everyone who's, you know, thanks for coming. Thanks for asking lots of interesting questions and, um, and following along, both here and in the Slack and at office hours. I, I, I just, I really appreciated it. You know, I just, you know, made some slides and made some notes and people came and that's been, that's been really nice. So thank you. So as for um, applications, so what we've, just to recap what we've done so far, day one, there was, okay, well, what is a topological field theory? It's a functor, okay. And some, some very basic things. And then after that, a series of steadily more complicated examples, getting into the uh, TVBW model, which really, you know, which get, either classifies all or a very large class of the, the sort of best 3D topological field theories, the fully extended ones. So today I want to do something different and talk about an application. And this application is, you know, you do not need topological field theory to compute Hurwitz numbers. You know, Hurwitz and Birdside did this 100 years before, um, before a TA even thought to, to define categories of topological field theories. But the generalizations of Hurwitz numbers to other Hurwitz problems, some of them, you know, admit TFT um, interpretations. And they're having the flexibility of topological field theories, you know, ma makes these problems much more tractable. So I'll, I'll tell you that story. I'll walk you through the proof and also walk you through some of the formulas in the end. There will be, there will be like combinatorial stuff and say maybe a little bit about what happens in some related cases. So I wanted to do this because there's lots of times where people hear, okay, like a topological field theory is this enormous amount of structure, but then what do you do with it? And sometimes you say, well, that structure is there and that's what I'm, you know, I'm gonna study it. But this is based on a talk I gave a couple of years ago at one of our junior seminars at UT. And based on what I heard afterwards, this is, this is the kind of thing that people didn't know was out there, or at least the one person who talked to me was like, wow, I'm glad to hear that there are these applications. Also, I've heard, based on what I've heard by, uh, from talking to some of you is maybe, maybe I should have given a talk about like the relationship with like condensed matter physics for the Friday lecture, but um, it's, unfortunately, it's a little late for that now. But if you do want to chat about that, I mean, there's office hours, you know how to reach me, email or Slack or something. And I'm, you know, I'm happy to chat about that stuff. So if, if you want to learn about the relationship with topological phases of matter, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm happy to chat. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. So Hurwitz numbers, it's a kind of enumerative question. So it's a, it's a particularly simple one. You know, there are much fancier enumerative questions coming up in, um, for example, algebraic geometry. But because it is simple, it's in particular, it's a top, it's a, it becomes a topological question. So we're gonna reduce it then to, um, to understanding quantities in a 2D topological field theory, specifically a, a, uh, an untwisted digraph witten theory or finite gauge theory that we constructed on Wednesday. And then we're gonna solve it. And so that's an excuse to talk about a couple of different things. So I'm not really gonna get into the weeds, but this is related to you know, the, the general story about 2D topological field theories and uh, representation theory of finite groups. And it's related to the, um, like some of the stuff is behind the scenes using the fact that, that this 2D TFT is in fact fully extended. So I did not properly say, okay, like the stuff that we would need to say in order to get into those, um, into the details of extended TFT. And that would take, that would take a while to, to actually, to say that even at a heuristic level. So I'm not gonna do that. What I am gonna do is I'm gonna have one slide where it's like, okay, you know, th this is a black box, but here's, here's sort of opening up a little bit. Here's an extended bordism and here's what it said, you know, here's what it's telling us. So nothing super heavy, but just sort of a shining a light on that th this is not just infinity categorical stuff. It it's also, it's there telling us useful things. And then after that, the last part of the talk is gonna be solving the theory. And so that amounts to a bunch of facts about the representation theory of finite groups, which I'm gonna black box. Um, Fulton and Harris is, a, is the reference that I learned this stuff from. And in particular, if there are typos, then that is where I will go to correct them. So just heads up. Ah, before I go on, are there any questions? Well, let me make sure that I, I can see chat. Okay, I, if there are no questions yet, then let us blaze forward. So one of the first theorems that, that you learn in topology or geometry is the classification of surfaces. And so what that means is closed oriented connected surfaces, or you know, just closed oriented surfaces, because you know, connected, you just take some disjoint units. And so this is known. We know that there is that up to diffeomorphism, there is a single closed oriented connected surface of each genus, and it's the n-hold torus. 
or the G hold torus. And you know, you, you can even generalize this. We know this for unoriented surfaces. We know this for um, we know the classification of spin structures. You know, we, we, we can even weaken some, you know, we know the classification of compact oriented surfaces, blah, blah, blah. So next, why don't we classify maps between them up to some notion of equivalence? Because, you know, space, the, the spaces of maps are going to be infinite dimensional. So as far as homotopy classes of maps go, you know, degree theory tells us that only two things can happen. And so, so, so degree theory and differential topology says that at a generic point, a map is a, is like there, there's, Sorry, the degree of the map, which is telling you the, the pre-image of a generic point is a, is a finite set. And the cardinality of that set is, again, it's, it's constant away from a measure zero subset of your, of your surface, of the codomain. So this is, this is a um, thing that is done in differential topology. And so there are two options. So, okay, I, I, I should say orientation preserving map. But um, because otherwise you could, for example, do some sort of like, you know, reflect us. Well, no, you could swap orientations and then you're all right. Okay. So what there, there are two things that can happen. The first is you have a degree zero map and the image is a finite set. So we're going to throw these out because in some sense, you know how to class, you know how to classify these things. You know, you crush connect components to points and then you can map points into a surface. Like, as far as we care, we understand degree zero maps. And then positive degree n away from a finite set, pi is a is an n fold covering map. And here I need the absolute value because degree knows orientations. And if I like I, but I personally right now don't care about orientations. And so in this in the second case, a uh, where away from a finite set you are an n-fold covering map, that is called a branched covering map. Um, so you should think of, for example, if you take a, if you, so when you define the square root on complex numbers, you can take a branch cut, or you can say, actually, I'm going to take, I'm going to say that I have to wind around the, 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 um, a zero in the complex plane twice in order to get back where I started. And so that sort of double cover everywhere except for zero, where, where it's kind of weird. That is a, um, that is a branch cover. I have a picture on the next slide, but I'm not sure how good of a picture it is. So that I, I tried to give the Riemann surface example as well, or sorry, the uh, square root example as well. So on the left, we have an unbranched cover. Most covers of closed connected um, oriented surfaces look kind of like this. You have, um, you have a, you sort of make a pinwheel and then you rotate it around and then, you, you know, so you quotient out by that. So this hole in the middle is shrunk by five, but it's still preserved. And these five holes are identified and then you get your surface of genus two. So if you play with, if you play around with Euler characteristic, knowing that it has to be multiplicative on unbranched covers, then I think you can see that all covers Except maybe on like the sphere and the torus, arise in this way. This is a prelim part. Uh, this roughly was a prelim problem the year that I took the algebraic topology prelim. So it, it's like the fidget spinner of covers, basically, except that this has five instead of three. Anyways, moving on from that terrible, terrible sentence, here's an example of, an, of a branched cover. So I highlighted these two points. So this is a double cover away from these two points. So you can see that these two, um, the, the, the two holes go to, there's one hole. These two arcs go to a single arc. And um, in the neighborhood of each point, this looks like z goes to z squared. You know, plus one, in, like the, the positive and negative axes just sort of get, get crushed into one. But these two points are, are independent. Like they, they're not, they're, you know, we're not identifying them. So this is sort of, you know, twist maybe around each point to get this um, branched cover. Um, so our goal is to classify branched covers because we understand, so we understand unbranched covers. Those are told to us by the, by the theory of the Euler characteristic. And we know, we know Euler characteristics of these things. So let's look, at, let's look at branch points, which make life a little funny, a little more funny. Um, sometimes people care about this from different angles. So I'm telling you everything in a differential topology perspective because I, I mean, I'm an algebraic topologist who likes manifolds. The people who originally thought about, um, well, okay, that's not true. A lot of the people who care about Hurwitz numbers do so for algebraic geometry reasons. So they're like, all right, I have a um, smooth, complex curve, you know, one dimensional variety, which is a scheme such that blah, 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 oh, projective curve, scheme such that blah, 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 blah. 
And you end up getting that this, this is telling you the same story. You, know, you draw the complex points of this curve in the analytic topology and you get your, um, your closed connected oriented surface. Or maybe you're a complex geometer and you want to do this for Riemann surfaces. And so it turns out that classifying branched covers as far as, you know, if you care about algebraic maps or, you know, for, for algebraic geometry or holomorphic maps for complex geometries or just good old, you know, smooth maps of surfaces and differential topology, you're going to compute the same Hurwitz numbers, which, which are, you know, the, the same enumerative invariance counting these things. So this is, you know, on the one hand, you might say, well, more stories is more interesting than fewer stories. And that is true. But on, you know, this, this is the Scheherazade principle. But on the other hand, one story that applies to many different fields is, I mean, I found this quite appealing when I first learned this story. So, you know, the, the good along with the bad. So our, so our goal is to, is to when, when we classify branched covers, what we're going to do, well, okay, rather than saying, okay, here's, here's the general form, what we're going to do is we're going to count them. And so a priori, this is, this is just like heavily, heavily countably infinite. You know, branch covers up to, up to isot isotopy or diffeomorphism of the data. So because you could say, well, let's just take degree zero covers, degree one covers, degree two covers, yada, 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 yada. Okay, great, let's fix. So we should fix additional data in order to obtain a finite number. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fix the degree of the cover. It is n to one. The next thing we're going to do is fix the number of branch points. So a branch point is a point where, where the cover is singular. It looks like z goes to z to the n, and it is no, rather than an n-fold cover. So this is, we, we're not going to fix where the branch points are, because it turns out you know, up to diffeomorphism, you can move points around on, your, on, a, on a manifold. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter where they are so much as the number that, that, that are there. And so, um, so we're going to fix that number. And we need to fix one more piece of data. And I'll draw, I'll draw a picture of this data in the next slide. Or, well, actually, I drew it on my chalkboard yesterday and then inverted the colors and upped the contrast. But we're going to say, what does it look like in a neighborhood of each point? So I have my branch point. And in a sphere of radius, ep sorry, a circle of radius epsilon around each branch point, the branch cover becomes an n fold cover of S1. And so the question is, which one do we get? So we need to fix that, those k pieces of, of data, those k covers of S1 up to isomorphism. And once we fix all of these three things, then we get finite numbers. So I'll show you on the next slide n fold covers of X1, S1. The point is that it's specified by a partition of n to it. Here, so here's, here's the branch point, and here is the, a disk around it. And we're going to take the boundary of that and look at the cover. So a cover of S1 has several connected. So, so an n-fold cover, we fixed n. We know that um, it's got several connected components. And there is a, because pi 1 is c, and there's a unique subgroup of index n inside z, then once we fixed, once we said I have a connected double cover of index k, we know what that cover is. It, it, it has automorphisms, but, but there's only one isomorphism type. So as soon as we specified, OK, there's, there's a, the, the, the connect components are something of, uh, which is fourfold, something which is twofold, and something which is onefold, then we know our cover up to isomorphism. And that data is precisely a partition of n. So in this case, n is 7. And we're saying, OK, one, you know, the first four elements go together, then the next two, then the last one. So we're specifying that partition, that 7 is 4 plus 2 plus 1. So unordered partition. Before I go on, are there any questions? All right. So um, sounds like everyone's got this covered. So now we're going to define Hurwitz numbers. So in some sense, from this like wibbly wobbly differential topological data, we're going to we're going to obtain this discrete data. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to fix the genus of the surface, you know, which is closed connected oriented, the degree that I that I that I mentioned, the number of branch points that I mentioned, the ramification data. So p1 through pk are partitions of n, and now we're going to define the Hurwitz number, fancy h of this data. And what are we doing? We're counting the number of isomorphism classes of branch covers with this data. So this this really should be branch covers. Sorry about that. And now we're counting them weighted by automorphisms. So if your branch cover has a lot of automorphisms, then then it contributes less to the count. So this is, I mean, this may sound like a weird cell, but this is a standard thing to do. So here is a fancy succinct way of saying this, is that, you can, is that fixing all this data, there is a group weight of branched covers. So the objects are branched covers, and the, I, the uh, morphisms are 
diffeomorphisms of of um, upstairs between the between the total spaces, which commute with the maps down. And so if you just so if you just said you know smooth maps instead of diffeomorphisms, well the only ones would be diffeomorphisms. So this thing is naturally a groupoid rather than a category. And so you, you know a natural the natural way to measure groupoids is instead of saying aha, choose isomorphism classes, count the number of isomorphism classes. It is to use the groupoid cardinality. So this behaves a little bit better under under cutting and pasting. And in fact, you know, we're going to get a TFT out of it, whereas you wouldn't. I think you you need that 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 automorph that weighting by automorphisms in order to in order to cut and paste. So on day on Wednesday, when we talked about digraph witten theory or finite gauge theory, the groupoid cardinality played a similar appearance. Um, this is not a coincidence because we are going to compute Hurwitz numbers using topological field theory. So let me let me sort of say what where where the land is. So Hurwitz set and solved this problem, and then Bur Burnside found a formula. And this was, again, this was over a century ago. Let me figure out what year that was. I got to return this book to the library someday. I graduated. Um, I think that they're, they're going to want it back. OK, they don't say the year in the introduction. I'm not going to make you wait while I hunt for it. But this was, I think it was like the late 1800s, maybe 1880s, 1890s, where Hurwitz asked this question. This was sort of the very beginnings of the study of representation theory. You know, Hurwitz, Rubinius, Burnside, and the like, like beginning to discover character tables and, you know, the sort of beautiful theory of rep theory of finite groups. But then there was this question of, okay, well, we can mix that with geometry using Hurwitz numbers. And so that's, that's, that's what they did. So more recently, and I think this was in the, the you know, the, the aughts, it was realized that this can be uh, done, that uh, Hurwitz's argument is sort of, it can be recast in terms of topological field theory. So I don't know whom to cite for this. If I, it seems like it was a folklore theorem that never has actually concretely appeared in print um, until, until uh, Sam Gunningham's paper, which acknowledges that the Hurwitz story in TFT is not original. I've heard people say, you know, Akunkov and maybe some of, uh, some of his collaborators, but, grain of salt here i don't you know it's possible there's a paper that you know someone's master's thesis just does this in topological field theory it's possible that okunkov has this paper which just says we do Hurwitz numbers with topological field theory here it is it's possible that it's an aside in this very long gromov witten theory paper i don't know but sometime in the 2000s this idea became clear without being without really being explicitly written down so people who are skeptical about categories and functors and all that jazz will 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 think here well Hurwitz did this thing a long time ago, and you're telling me that with all of this big complicated formalism that we spent a week on, you can solve problems that people knew how to solve in the 1800s. Big whooper. And honestly, you're not wrong. But the topological field theory approach generalizes quite well. There's many other counting problems that are Hurwitz like. And some of them can be solved with topological field theory, and some of them can't. These like Hurwitz numbers of completed cycles don't seem to have been a TFT description. But the the I mean we have a lot of we have a lot of tools coming from 2D topological field theory, which allow you to um, make progress on these enumerative problems. So um, so for example, there is this uh, notion of spin Hurwitz numbers, and so spin Hurwitz numbers are exactly the same, except we fix spin structures on the uh, on the domain and on the codomain. We ask that this um, we we say the ramification data. We say which spin structure on the circle we need. You know, it has to bound. And we we uh, take the so we take automorphisms of spin, of spin surfaces when we count, and we weight by the arf invariant of the of the uh, of the domain. So this is a um, I mean this problem, you know, you could try and extract an argument using just group theory and representation theory, but it's going to be much messier and harder. And so what happened is instead, Sam Gunningham wrote this paper as a graduate student, where he just did it with topological field theory. So this paper, by the way, I I, I highly highly recommend this paper. Sam Sam wrote a great resource, not just on how to compute spin Hurwitz numbers with topological field theory, but a lot of stuff about 2D topological field theory in the, in the spin and in the oriented case, which has been a resource for me as I've been learning. So check out that paper. So, okay, but why spin Hurwitz numbers? So it turns out that there is this question in gromov witten theory. So Jun Ho Lee and Thomas Parker computed gromov witten invariants of, um, of Kähler surfaces, of and something, 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 you have to throw out a couple examples, but surfaces of general type. And so they proved this, um, this remarkable theorem in differential geometry, which, um, which said, okay, if you, if you perturb your complex structure a little bit, then, then you can 
than your, J, your um, J holomorphic maps, the things that you want to count in gromov witten theory, the, they can, you can put them in the image of a canonical device. And that reduces this complex two-dimensional problem to a complex one-dimensional problem. And they do a, a little bit more of a reduction and they get out spin Hurwitz numbers, which is remarkable because they started with this thing that's like, you know, difficult to compute, very technical, very geometric, in their case, symplectic geometric, but you could also do algebraic geometry. And we end up with this like very differential topological invariant, spin Hurwitz numbers. And then Sam went and just said, here is your formula using topological field. So um, this is the kind, I mean, this is the kind of story that I find appealing. And I would like to, I, I would like to prove theorems like this, you know? And so here are some things that you might be able to um, generalize further. So there, you know, you could do this, this Hurwitz question with unoriented surfaces and people do. But another thing is, so the spin Hurwitz story that, that, that uh, Sam wrote down, it uses the ARF invariant. The ARF invariant of a spin surface generalizes to the ARF Brown Kervar invariant of a pin minus surface. And so it's possible that pin minus Hurwitz numbers appear in some sort of unoriented generalization of the Lee Parker story. So you know, the, the tools to actually compute these pin, pin minus Hurwitz numbers, they're almost in place. We don't know 2D pin minus TFT yet, but a lot of the stuff that's there, like a lot of the, the things that would allow you to solve that are in place. You could also ask about R spin structures. There is an R invariant. R spin TFT is understood thanks to um, work of, I think, Ingo Runkel, Laurent Segedy, and maybe some of their collaborators. If you are listening to this and I forgot to mention your paper or I, met, or you, I named you and you didn't work on this, sorry, but I do know there are some people in that group of collaborators that have stuff on R spin TFT. So there's, anyways, the point is there's, there's questions out there that are open that probably can be attacked by similar methods. And that will be hard to understand by um, just finite group th uh, rep theory methods. There's also lots of other Hurwitz questions, which I think are harder to dispatch with TFT, just to be clear. So how are we going to do this? So first, what we're going to do is we're going to convert from a question about covers, which, I mean, covers, honestly, they, they, they could be fields in topological field theory. They are local. But we're going to turn it into a question explicitly about principal bundles for the symmetric group. And this is going to make it easier for us to express that question in terms of finite gauge theory for this group. So this untwisted digraph with theory. So finally, 2D fully extended TFTs are solved. And what I mean by solved is you pick a manifold and, sorry, you can, you can express your 2D TFT in terms of algebraic data, uh, specifically a semi-simple Frobenius algebra. So the val then you pick a, um, a manifold with boundary or not, and you, you can just compute what the value of that 2D TFT is in terms of fairly simple algebraic data. So I'm gonna kind of go lightning through that um, because it's like, we only need pieces of it. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna import that algebraic data. We're gonna say, hey, Fulton, hey, Harris, you, uh, you've written down the theory of the rep theory of the symmetric group. And we're just gonna take some formulas and put them, put them into other formulas. And then voila, we're gonna get the formula for Hurwitz numbers. Any questions about this? Okay, then without further ado, let's, 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 let's compute some Hurwitz numbers. So first, this, I'm, I'm going to start with a more familiar analog of the thing I'm about to do. So, okay, maybe more familiar. There is a bijective correspondence between vector bundles of rank n and principal GLN R bundles. And so this is why vector bundles are classified by BGLN instead of you know, some other weird thing. So specifically, given a vector bundle, there is a thing called the bundle of frames. And so the fiber at, at a point so we have a vector space associated to that point, which is non-canonically Rn. And this has a set of bases, a space of bases, in fact. And so what you can say is, well, what, what kind of space is that? If you choose a particular basis, you choose a point, then the you know, every other basis is related by a unique change of basis matrix. So, this, so the space of bases is non-canonically isomorphic to GLNR. And GLNR acts on it by change of basis matrix. So it turns out that the space of bases is what's called a GLNR torso. It is a space with a free transitive right action of GLNR. So you could think of this, a, a circle is a torso of SO2. If you choose a base point, you can identify it with SO2, but, um, but until then, all you have is that SO2 rotates it, and this is a free transitive action. So um, principal bundles are sort of torsos and families. Okay, so if you, if you take the, so given a, a point, you take the, the uh, bases of, of the fiber at that point of a vector, vector bundle, and that's a GLNR torsor, and this fits together in families. So the space of bases at each point gives you a uh, principal GLNR bundle extracted from a vector bundle. 
And conversely, let's say you have a principal GL and R bundle. Then there's an instruction called take the associated vector bundle. So sometimes this is called the mixing construction. And um, there, there's a lot to say about this. Like it's, it's a very, very useful thing to have. And so what we're going to do, GL and R acts on P from the right. That's what, it, that's what a principal bundle is. And it acts on RN, you know, the standard representation. And so we're going to obtain a vector bundle by taking P cross RN and mixing the actions. We're going to take the equivalence relation, where if you acted on a point in P by, by a matrix G, that's the same thing as, well, what if you kept P and just acted on the vector in RN by G? And so this defines a bijective correspondence between these things. You may be able to suit that up into an equivalence of categories. I haven't really thought about that. But it should, yeah, I think that should be true. So likewise, you know, there, there's many variants of this instruction. Rank and complex vector bundles, for instance, GLN C bundles. Oriented vector, you could also do oriented real vector bundles, you know, GLN plus. You could add a metric and then, you know, and care about orthonormal oriented bases and get a principal SON bundle and, and back, back and forth. So this is a very general way to tie the, the, the linear, parameterized linear algebra of vector bundles to the um, parameterized group theory of um, principal bundles. So what we're going to do is not that. We're going to do a discrete analog of that, a bijective correspondence between n-fold covers of a space, which may not be connected, and principal SN bundles. So usually when we study covering theory, we only care about connected covers. And in that case, you know, you know the classification. If you use pi 1. And here, we're going to fix the degree of the cover and now allow disconnected covers. And we're going to get a different classification. So let's say I have an n-fold cover. This is not a branch cover. This is an honest n-fold cover. At a point, so the fiber is a, um, it's just a set of n elements, and it is not canonically isomorphic to the standard 1 through n. So in particular, it's not ordered. But I could pick total orderings. And any two total orderings are related by a permutation, right? So this is sort of a discrete version of a basis. So the set of total orderings of the fiber is an SN torsor. It's, um, it's a set with a free transitive right SN action. And if I, move, if I move around in the base M, then these orderings, you know, you can, you can move them together. There might be, like, there might be monodromy depending on the cover, but it's locally trivial. And so if you, if you do this at all points in the base, what you obtain is a principal SN bundle. Now, the other direction looks very similar. It's a mixed construction. Given a principal SN bundle, well, SN naturally acts on one through N by permutations. And we're going to make the same thing. And this is an n, you know, uh, n fold cover. Again, may not be connected. For example, if you start with the trivial bundle, you're going to get the trivial cover. You know, and n pancakes, not, no, no monotony. So what this does is, you know, if, if you keep track of, well, what does this do to morphisms? This defines an equivalence of groupoids from the groupoid of degree n covers and, and you know, maps which commute with the maps down to the base and principal SN bundles. Crucially, we, we have not yet accounted for branching. Any questions so far? OK. So now we need to deal with branching. And so you can think of this as sort of allowing singularities. So we're going to do two things. So the first thing that we're going to do is we can say, OK, I'm going I'm to I'm consider relative n-sheeted covers. So I pick a subset of X and I say, and I pick a cover on that subset, a specific one. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix, I'm going to say that I want my cover to look like that specific cover when I'm on Y. So the, the, the groupoid of, of relative n-sheeted covers is those covers. So we, we know that they're isomorphic to, to our fixed cover Y prime when we're on Y. But moreover, it's not just condition they're isomorphic. It's data of an isomorphism. And this is sort of the standard thing when you have a category is that you, you need, you need, this data needs to come along for the ride. And so morphisms in this category are isomorphisms of covers, and they commute with, the, with, these, uh, with these isomorphisms. So they commute with the maps down to the base and the, the I, identifying it with the, with the fixed cover on Y. So, okay, so that's relative n sheeted covers. In the same way, you can define relative principal bundles. So I only said SN, but I mean, you could do, you could do G. And so, for example, um, so, so what is this? You pick a principal bundle on Y and you say, okay, I want principal bundles on X together with an isomorphism of the restriction to Y with our fixed bundle Q. And so now, now we get a group weight again. And so the equivalence I mentioned 
you know, this take the mix construction or take the, the uh, bundle of or orderings, it, ex you know, it extends to an equivalence of group weights in the relative set. Are there any questions about this slide? It's, uh, is there a natural like, general statement that encompasses SM, JLN, and then other interesting things at once? Oh, probably. Like what's the adjective kind of on the structure group, I guess? So I don't have a general thing where, so, so part of the problem is I don't even know the, the statement in the absolute case. So um, like if you said, okay, well, what data allows you to pass isomorphically from GLN bundles to vector bundles? And I don't have a good answer for that. Um, okay. I was just wondering. Probably, okay, here's probably how it'll go. So you prove it for GLN bundles and vector bundles, and you do that for the relative case too. And then you say, okay, if you have a faithful representation of a group into GLN, then you're good to go. Right, because this is coming from the permutation representation secretly. Interesting. So, um, right, because if, if you have a principal, if you have a vector bundle and you know that its structure group reduces to SN via the permutation representation, then you can take, you can take the, the sort of the basis that you get at every point and just take that, that subset and that's, a, that's an end sheet to cover. Um, disclaimer, I haven't thought through that fully yet, but that should be true. Okay, I believe it's reasonable. Thanks. Yeah, no, good question. Uh, more questions. Okay, I'll carry on. Again, please, please always interrupt me to, to ask questions when you have them. So, okay, this is the same, this is the same picture, but the point is that we want to get from ramification data to relative principal SN bundles. So, or so specifically. Let's say we have a branched cover and uh, branched at, at these branch points. So this is equivalent to a genuine cover on the, when, if you drill a hole around each branch point, a, you know, a really small one, and, and you keep track of the ramification data around each branch point, that, you know, it's equivalent. So what I'm saying here is if you know your ramification data, so you know the stuff that's on this, in this picture, you have your branch point, you have a neighborhood of it. And you know that away from a small neighborhood of your, of your branch point, you know what the cover looks like. It looks like this. The claim is that there's a unique way to fill in that cover. And it doesn't have isomorphs. Like it doesn't contribute additional isomorphisms. And so what's going on? I have a circle, you know, unit complex numbers. And I know, okay, Z goes to Z, Z to the K. K is one, K is two, K is four. How do you fill that in on the disk? Well, you say Z goes to Z to the K. And sure enough, it's branched at the origin precisely and everywhere else is fine. So if you know your actual end sheeted cover away from a neighborhood of each branch point, and you know, you've kept track of the ramification data, then there's only one way to fill it in. So this is good because we've left the world of branched covers and we've ended up with relative covers, right? I have a cover everywhere and I have an identification with, you know, the ramification data is saying, I have identified it with the standard cover, this particular cover of S1 given by the partition. Um, so to summarize, branched covers give us relative covers, relative end sheeted covers on the complement of the, um, of a neighborhood of the, of the branch locus. And then based on the, the correspondence last time, we get relative principal SN bundles given partitions as our sort of boundary data. Uh, is, this, is this all good? All right, so now finite gauge theory. So just, just to very, very briefly summarize, on Wednesday, we used the finite path integral to do this sum over principal bundles for a finite group. And so this was modeling quant, you know, path integral quantization for a gauge theory with, with a connection. But you know, making this rigorous is kind of hard. So I took the coward's way out and just said, let's do it for G finite. And so given a TFT of oriented manifolds with a principal G bundle, you sum over the G part and you just obtain a TFT of oriented manifolds. And so what I've been calling finite gauge theory, uh, Z sub G, is where you do this, where you start with the trivial theory and you sum over the G bundles. Sometimes people call this untwisted digraph witten theory. And I've even heard it called topological Yang-Mills. But um, th th those are awfully fancy things for what is just finite gauge theory. And digraph witten theory usually refers to when you, you throw in a co-cycle co to twist it. So this theory, you can think of, you know, I, I mentioned this topological field theory and drew analogies with physics. You could think of this as a purely combinatorial gap. It's, you know, there's some functor that some, someone introduced 
And what does it do? It counts principal G bundles with, you know, with automorphism success, the finite, uh, finite path integral does. But it, you, you could sort of plug your ears to all the physics going on. And you could say, I, I have a thing which counts principal G bundles. Because plugging your ears is not effective when you wear headphones. Anyways, um, I count principal G bundles and I have a common control gadget for doing that. And what a wonderful coincidence because we just found that we care about principal G bundles, relative principal G bundles, but sure, principal G bundles. So we're going to rephrase. So, so just, just that, that, that was segueing in. We're going to rephrase this counting question purely in terms of finite gauge theory. So we, we will have left the world of Herbert's numbers and we'll just have a question of, I want to compute these quantities in this topological field. So first, let's say that the number of branch points is zero. So we're counting actual coverings. So we're, we're, we're trying to obtain the groupoid cardinality. And the groupoid cardinality is preserved under equivalence of groupoids. So what are we doing? We're, we want to compute the, um, the partition function of SN uh, finite gauge theory on our closed surface, closed connected point. Uh, why is that? Because if you remember from Wednesday, the partition function sums the, uh, the value of the, of the classical theory weighted by the number of automorphisms. And so when the classical theory is one, the trivial theory, we're just computing the groupoid cardinality. Or sorry, we're just, yeah, we're just computing the groupoid cardinality. We're just counting things weighted by automorphisms. So th this Hurwitz number is just the partition function on a closed surface. Cool. Now let's say that there are n branch points. Ah, shit. Uh, n is not the same as n. Um, OK. Let's say there are k branch points. And this should be a k, and this should be a k. This should still be n. This should still be n. So Sn symmetric group, sigma g n should be sigma g k. Sorry about that. Hopefully, what's, what happens next will be clear. But if not, uh, tell me what to, what, what's confusing, and I'll clarify. So we're drilling out k small disks from, from sigma. This is traditionally called sigma gk. And the ramification data. So what is the ramification data? The ramification data is a, it's a principle, it's a, um, like, as we mentioned last time, we had a relative principal SN bundle. And so we've specified what happens on the boundary. We have said, I have a principal bundle on the boundary circles for, for SN. So this ramification data is actually an element of the state space. So um, let, me, let me say that a little more slowly. So ZSN of a circle, you know, if you, it, it's free on the set of isomorphism classes of principal S1 bundles on S1, on, or SN bundles on S1, oof. Right, because it's, um, if you remember, we, we had this section of a line bundle, sections of a line bundle, but for the trivial line bundle, for the trivial theory, we're just, every, every isomorphism class admits a unique section. Up to, yeah, a unique, up to rescaling, sorry. So the point is we get the free vector space on isomorphism classes of principal bundle, SN bundles. So for, now, now when we have a bunch of different boundary circles, we tensor them together. And so we can choose the tensor product of delta function at our particular principal SN bundle and tensor those together over the boundary components. And that's how the ramification data defines an element of the boundary, the state space of the boundary. Is that, is that, does that make sense? especially the confusion N versus K. Okay, no one's saying anything yet, but again, please feel free to, to interrupt me. So if you stare at the push-pull formula, you know, the ways that it's counting with automorphisms, and there, there, there is something happening here. I don't want to diminish this. Uh, just stare at the formula is trivial. Like there, there's stuff that you have to think about here. But after, after thinking about it, what, what it tells you is that the Herbert's number for this, for this ramification data. So counting relative principal bundles, where I fix this ramification data, it's precisely the linear map, which is uh, defined as follows. Sigma GN is a bordism from, sorry, Sigma GK is a bordism from K circles to the empty set. And so applying our topological field theory, we get a linear map from the state space of, of those K circles to the complex numbers. And so pick our tensor product of delta functions, hit it with this linear map, and what you get out, you know, if you, if you run finite gauge theories, it's telling you, hey, I'm counting relative principal SN bundles, you know, for the, for the uh, boundary data that you fixed on those circles. And that is, in fact, that, that's the Hurwitz number for that ramification data. So, Sorry, what's up? yeah, what's up? Could you just clarify what you mean by delta function here? I'm not sure. Yeah, so I have, so, ah, yeah, sorry. So, Z... So, so, okay, the, the finite gauge theory on the circle 
is free on the set of isomorphism classes. And that is a finite set. So you can think of the vector space, the free vector space on this, as just the vector space of functions from this set to the complex numbers, right? Like, is everyone with me so far? OK, cool. Um, so what we're so in that case, delta function is kind of you know a silly thing. You know, I say it's equal to zero everywhere, and it's one at the at the at the L, L, at this principal bundle that I care about. So there's no there's no topology, there's no distributions, there's just finite sets. So that that's what I mean by delta function. I realized that I said that without like I probably should have clarified that. So sorry about that. So at each boundary, you're just indicating which cover you have by yes. one. That's yeah, it. precisely. Thanks. Yeah. Great, thanks for asking. Are there more questions? Okay, we will we will beat on. Uh, both pushing ceaselessly forward. So, oh, so I guess just the last point of this slide is we no longer care. Like in some sense, we can throw out the whole bunch, you know, coverings and like you know, Hurwitz stuff, and just like we just have a question about topological field theory. Sometimes it feels like like when I'm doing stuff, it's like okay. Other people care about this thing for some reason. I got to read about that reason, learn about the reason, and then reduce it to a thing that I care about. Now, you know, other people care about that. Great. I'm going to prove a theorem about topological field. Um, so the folk theorem uh, proved in many places. Uh, Robert Dykraff's thesis contains a version of this. Um, Joachim Koch has a, has a really nice book sort of expositing an introduction to topological field theory itself using uh, motivated by this theorem says the 2D oriented TFTs are classified by commutative Frobenius algebras. I am not going to say exactly what this is, but the point, you know, th this is a this is a theorem you might have seen before when looking at TFT. There is a fancier theorem. So you can find proofs of this. Um, it is so Chris Schomerpriest's thesis, which is like some terrifyingly large number of pages, just does this in, like by hand. And um, it also follows from the comportism hypothesis. And this is exposited somewhere in Fried Hopkins, Fried Hopkins, Lurie, and Telemann's paper. There's a unique paper with that set of four authors. And they give a very condensed argument for how this goes. But the point is, you know, the, 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 the sort of better theorem is that 2D fully extended TFT. So the, and fully extended means there's higher categories. But when I say fully extended, I really mean the kinds of things that just keep showing up. You know, it's, it's, it's this imprecise fact that the most interesting topological field theories that, that pop up, unless you're doing a certain kind, like unless you're doing certain kinds of things, but the ones that generally keep showing up are the fully extended ones. And so 2D fully extended oriented TFTs valued in what's called the Merida category or the Merida two category of algebras. So objects are algebras, morphisms are bimodules, two morphisms are bimodule homomorphisms. If these words are not, are, are, are like, you know, not super helpful for you, sorry, we'll be back, back on track soon. But the idea, just very, very quick sketch, is that fully dualizable is what gets you semi-simple. And then the Frobenius condition is what gets us from framed 2D TFTs to oriented TFTs. So in some sense, it's identifying the two framings of the interval. Or saying, identifying what, what we attach to the two frames of the interval. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Oh, wait, actually, I am. So how does this correspondence go? So we have a semi-simple Frobenius algebra, and it's going to be called A. and what is it attached to various things that we care about? So first of all, Z of S1 is the center of A. So you know the center is traditionally denoted Z of A. And I hope, I hope it is clear why I have not done that. So a quick sketch of the proof. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it uses things in extended TFT that I didn't get into. But I wanted to show it as like a sort of a concrete, here's how extended TFT buys you computations. So here's the circle. In ordinary TFT, it's just an object. It's in, it, you know you, you can't split it further. But in the fully you know in the Bordism two category, you can cut it into a co-evaluation followed by an evaluation at one at a category level higher. So this is a Bordism from the empty set to point plus and point minus to the and then an, followed by another Bordism to the empty set. So remember, I we said okay, m on the outgoing, negative m on the incoming. You know, or you to, when you keep track of orientation. So that's why these minus signs don't quite look like they match. So if you actually go, if you go through and figure out what data is assigned in, you know, for, for, your, for your 2D framed TFT, then what you get is that uh, the bimodule you get for, for co-evaluation is A as an, a, as an A tensor A op module on the right. And then here you get an A tensor A op module on the left. 
sort of A as, as, as a bimodule over itself trivially. And composition is tensor product. So what you end up getting is that Z of S1 as a vector space is A tensor over A tensor A op A. And the you know, theorem, like algebra theorem, this is the center. It also picks up a, a for A and out. And so the center has an algebra structure and that coincides with the algebra structure from pair of pants, which I probably is Ekman Hilton. So the center has primitive idempotence. Um, oh, okay. I may have said, I may have said, a, okay. So I said the center of A, but later on, I've just been referring to A. So I think from now on, we're replacing A with its center. So this has, has primitive idempotence. Um, and ultimately, because it's semi-simple, these are, these are like useful. So these are, they are idempotent in that they square, they square to themselves. And you can't factorize them as sums of other idempotents. They're primitive. So the, in some sense, this is telling you how to decompose your algebra as a, um, as a direct sum of simple, simple things. So what data do we get from a 2D TFT? Well, we, we get the, the incoming disk as a Borism from the empty set to S1. And so that sends one to the sum of the primitive idempotents. So the uh, a Frobenius algebra has an inner product. And the, so the outgoing disk is what's called the co-unit, lambda. And so what you can do is you can take this unit map and uh, just hit it, use the inner product to obtain an adjoint. And that's what lambda is. So the, um, there, there's, there's the, also the, the pair of pants morphism from two circles to one circle. And that is multiplication. And then the other one, again, you can use the adjoint to do this, but explicitly on primitive impotence, it satisfies this formula. So, um, okay, containing this is the assertion that this, is, that this uh, denominator is never zero. So now we know what it is on all morphism, like on all closed, oh, sorry, we know what this is on all surfaces with boundary. If, you, if you're doing extended TFT, you think about surfaces with corners and we're just not gonna do that. We're saying that, okay, you know, given a surface with boundary, we can chop it up into a bunch of copies of disks, incoming and outgoing, and pairs of pants, incoming and outgoing. And this is just sort of the genus decomposition. So this, in principle, this kind of abstract uh, formula in terms of primitive idempotence is telling us how to, compute the, um, how to compute quantities in this TFT. So in principle, all we have to do is figure out what these uh, idempotence are for S, for um, the, or figure out what A and its idempotence are for SN, like finite gauge theory for SN, and then compute some of these formulas. Okay, so the first formula is, so, so for closed connected oriented, you know, where we, where we don't have to worry about like boundaries, you, you chop into a bunch of, like I said, the genus decomposition, and you get this formula for the partition function. So for finite gauge theory, the uh, semi-simple Frobenius algebra is the group algebra. So this is not commutative, but its center, what we assigned to S1, is the ring of characters under pointwise multiplication. So, so this is commutative. And so this has the inner product that you may have seen in rep theory, this sort of convolution like or not convolution but like okay well it's the inner product you're average you're averaging this this sum pairing isn't there a uh, I might be misremembering like do you need complex conjugate on like uh phi there or am I thinking of something else oh maybe that needs to be here I think you're right thank you good point uh if psi is a character then the value on g inverse is the same oh. as conjugate oh wait that's right thanks Jeffrey cool. Yeah, actually, no, it's, it's really good that you're here, Jeffrey, because I think you know this stuff better than I do at this point. Um, are there more questions here before I, um, before I press forward? So now we're gonna import a bunch of formulas from the rep theory of SN, sort of with, without, like, like kind of blindly. So there's this nice theory that I you know, encourage you to all look at with like, you know, young diagrams and, and the like. So conjugacy classes of SN are indexed, you know, they're, they're given by cycle type. And those are indexed by partitions of that, right? You say, okay, well this, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F. And moreover, isomorphism classes of irreducible SN representations are indexed by partitions of N via young diagrams. These are not the same index. There's like this non-trivial change of basis between those two, not change of basis, but like change, you know, change of something. So this in particular implies the primitive idempotence of uh, the class functions on SN uh, satisfy the following formula. There's a, um, first you normalize, and then you sum over permutations times each permutation. 
So this, so again, this formula is the idempotent for, for a particular primitive representation. And so when you, when you take the co-unit, what you get is you get um, the dimension of E over N factorial squared. And so why is this? Because this is an idempotent. We can just say it's lambda of EV squared and lambda of AB is the inner product A, to a with B. Okay. We need, so as I mentioned, the, the, the two descriptions of conjugacy classes and irreducible representations in terms of partitions, they're not the same description. We need to change a basis formula. So I want to understand if I evaluate a character on the delta function at a conjugacy class. So I just I have so I evaluate an element in a conjugacy class, which in the representation in the in the character, sorry. Yeah, I evaluate it on an element in the conjug on conjugacy class, which I'm thinking of as the delta function in the um, in this algebra of class functions. So it satisfies this formula. You know, it you have to sum over irrex and their primitive idempotence. So why are we doing this? Because we want to evaluate this this uh, finite gauge theory on a surface with with a boundary with a um, with this boundary data. So we and so we want to understand our principal bundle has a determine is like equivalent data to a conjugacy class. So to evaluate, we want to know these like understand get from conjugacy classes as you know sort of as as cycle type as monodromy to conjugacy classes in terms of representations, so primitive idempotence. So that's what this formula is telling us. And then here's two more facts. So there's, there's just some combinatorial stuff, which is if you pick a conjugacy class given by a partition, how big is it? The, this is the answer. Next, if we have the representation given by a partition, what, how, how big is it? What is its dimension? So first of all, you have to do this weird normalization thing where you say, okay, take the i entry in the partition, add the total number, and then subtract i. And then you take a discriminant. So these LIs, like I mentioned, you're modifying the size of the partitions. And now here's a formula for the dimension of that representation. Um, I'm not going to get into, um, th there, there's a lot to say here that I honestly do not feel qualified to talk about, like sort of where these come from, the like, relationship with other things in common matrix and rep theory. Some, some mathematicians said that, you know, gambling is just the applied representation theory of the symmetric groups. I'm not going to get in, I'm not going to comment on that. So now let's compute some Hurwitz numbers. So I sort of alluded to this, but here's a picture. My sigma GM decomposes as a bunch of outgoing pairs of pants like this, followed by incoming and then outgoing, a bunch of the, these things, and then a disk. So what's going on here? We have a whole bunch of boundary circles and we're just sort of, you know, you're, you're sort of isolating each one off in its own too, but that's diffeomorphic to just sort of bringing them all together, like on the neighborhood of, a, like on, a, on the region of a hemisphere. And so this gives us M boundary components. And then we also have G holes. And so we chop a hole in two, and that's how we get these uh, copies of pants. So we do a whole bunch of those. And now we have M plus one boundary components. So we just got to cap off this guy, which is what the disk is doing. This picture came out much better than I thought, given, well, that I made it on a chalkboard late at night last night. So this first one is multiplication. And the second one, the you know, second and third, send a primitive idempotent to this, you know, we take we take the co-unit, we uh, take the one minus g power, as we've sort of already seen. So this is this is good. And so then 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 you start plugging stuff in. So the change of base formula says, okay, well, you have your I mentioned that we have for each part each boundary component, we have a, a partition and a delta function for that, and we tensored it together. That is the thing that we want to hit with the uh, linear map that, that the finite gauge theory assigns to the boards. And so, okay, well, we multiply and then, right, so, so first we multiply and then we re-express using the change of basis formula that we get this sum over irrex in terms of primitive idempotence. And now we need to send each primitive idempotent to some number, and that number is the co-unit, which is dim v over n factorial to the one minus g. So when we do this, um, I'm realizing that this two here, this squared, probably should be two minus two g. So I, I sorry about that. Um, but when you do that, you get what a formula that Burnside found for Hurwitz numbers. So so you know we started with um, with covering theory, and we've ended up with something just expressed in terms of the rep theory of S n. So that's pretty cool. But this stuff. Like, let's try and make this as combinatorial as possible. You know, you have a computer and you want to just sort of like count stuff without having to think about rep theory. 
And so it's it's a little bit tricky. Like Hurwitz numbers, honestly, if you want some explicit large Hurwitz number, it's going to be hard, even with the formula. So we had these purely combinatorial formulas for the size of, of conjugacy classes and the dimensions of representations. So we're gonna, so you plug and chug, right? Plug and chug. And what you obtain is this formula for the Hurwitz numbers. This is almost completely combinatorial. We have, um, oops, this bar is just a typo. We have a bunch of, um, we, we, we have these sort of modified sizes of partitions, Li. We have a discriminant. We have this, um, this quantity associated to a partition. And crucially, we have the, ca the character for a partition Q in terms of a different partition P, uh, PJ. So this part is not, not entirely combinatorial, but you can make a combinatorial using the Frobenius character form. This is annoying, it's inexplicit, complicated, so we're not going to do it. So, okay, here is our answer. It's kind of, I mean, it's a big formula, but the, the point is, just as a retrospective, the tools that we, that we developed in the last week to handle TFT allow us to just get this, extract from a geometric or topological question, a combinatorial question, and solve it. So that's all, for, that's all that I've got. i just like to thank you all for, being around, for sticking around this week, for uh, uh, coming and asking cool questions. And uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed my course. There will be office hours again uh, today at the usual time, which is 3. So if, if I see you there, great. If not, have a good weekend. And yeah, let me know. Do you have any questions? Let's unmute and thank the speaker. Okay, so if there are not questions yet, let me...